Okay, so uh, today the topic is repeated games. Uh, so repeated games is different from uh, what you did in assignment one, right? In assignment one, the idea was uh, at every point of time you have this Nash equilibrium of a static game, and at every point of time, or uh, at every point of time, you pick an action according to the distribution P, you picked an action according to distribution Q, and then you played the game and you averaged the payoff. Okay? So, in that particular game, each player did not react to the history of actions of the other player. Okay? But now, I'm going to assume that you have an N player game, but each player is keeping track of the history of the actions of the other player. question with the players is whether I should reveal my private information to the other players or not. Okay, given that they are going to play this game for infinite time steps, it may be possible by looking at their actions, you can infer what information they have. And why is it useful? Well, it was useful in The idea is by looking at the action, or by looking at the decisions taken by the other player, can you infer what information the other player has? Okay, of course, you have to set it up as a game, uh, but, uh, but that's what it's useful for. Uh, as far as engineering setting is concerned, again, uh, it's, so I, I think of it as something that is useful in adversarial situations where you want to get some information out of adversary by carefully looking at its action. Uh, but I haven't seen many papers written on it. Uh, maybe there are, but I just haven't encountered it. So something you can keep in mind, especially those of you who might be working on game theoretic uh, problems. So the idea is you have n players, and each player has a history. Uh, it's a symmetric information. So HT is the uh, set of is the action taken by all players before time t. And each player has to take an action uh, or each player has to decide a strategy gamma it which maps ht to a I T or probability distribution over A I T delta A I T. Okay, probability distribution over its action set. So this is a behavioral strategy. And the cost function, so well let's the cost function let me call it as J I of gamma 1 gamma n is the average cost uh, so let's say this is finite horizon t time steps t equals 1 to capital T expected uh, expected value of summation and this expected value depends on gamma uh, this is the same cost every time cost depends on actions actions are chosen according to the behavioral strategy gamma and this is my 
this is my expected cost function expected cost of player i Okay, so the setting is clear. You have n players. You have a finite horizon. The each player observes the entire set of actions taken by all the players uh, before time t. Based on that information, it has to take an action, or probably uh, it has to take uh, it has to come up with a strategy that is a distribution that takes into account the history and outputs a distribution over all the actions, and then it takes an action according to that, receives a payoff or receives a cost. And you want to come up with a, you want to find a Nash equilibrium for this particular, uh, for this part for, for the average cost that is incurred by player i. So the first result, which is kind of obvious, uh, theorem one. So n e Nash equilibrium of static game, which is a single stage game, is also a. Nash equilibrium of repeated game of T stage game. Okay, this is the not so useful result, which basically is saying that well, if you use the same strategy over and over again, you essentially that also forms a Nash equilibrium of the repeated game. Okay. Uh, there is something to be. I mean, this is not the, the this is not the the correct way of writing it. I'm essentially using the same strategy at every point of time, and that's the Nash equilibrium of the repeated game. But that's not very useful. Okay, we want to come up with a useful characterization of uh, what kind of payoffs are achievable in this setting. Okay, so the question is, what vector of Expected payoffs or cost is achievable okay so so let's uh, start with an example. which is uh, in terms of utility function. So this is my utility functions. Uh, player one has action top, bottom, left, right. The payoffs are one, one, four, zero, zero, four, and three, three. Okay, this is like a this is like a pr uh, prisoner's dilemma game. <coughs> so the first thing we want to find, this is uh, this is the utility function. Okay, so the first thing we want to find is min max value. So I'm going to define min max value v i as min of a minus i max of a i u i a i a minus i okay so so what is happening the other players take certain amount take an action so this is by the way the 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 value ai minus i that minimizes this function is known as punishment okay punishment imposed by all other players onto player i okay what does that mean if so let's say a <coughs> minus i star is a punishment strategy of other players so 
So what does that mean? That means that V bar I is equal to max of A I U I A I A minus I star. Okay. So right. So this A I star is the minimizing. Uh, so, so what happens if other players act according to this punishment strategy? Player I can secure at most this much value. Okay, that's the maximum value that player I can secure for himself. Uh, so this is the maximum value, max value player I can secure for himself. Okay, so other players act according to punishment strategy. What can player I do? Well, player I can only maximize his own value by picking its own action and this is what, uh, this is what the maximum value that player I can secure is going to be. So this is, this is same as a security value that we studied in the beginning of the course for zero sum and non-zero sum games. Okay, you can, similarly you can define mini max cost, sorry, maxi, maximum cost, which is the maximum cost that player I has to pay in order to play the game. Okay, it cost can be lower if he collaborates with other players but if he doesn't, then other players are going to punish him. How, how are they going to punish him? Well, they are going to act according to this strategy, okay, so that player I's value is minimized, okay. And how much can player I secure for himself? Well, this is the value that he can secure for himself. So let's see for this game, what is what is my V bar 1? So there are only two players. So this is player 1. So if player 2 acts according to L, he can only secure 1. So uh, equals to 1. And this is minimum of 1 comma if player 2 picks R, then also 4. So min of 1 comma 4 equals to 1. That's the value that player 1 can secure for himself. Same thing for player 2, V bar 2 is also equal to 1. Okay, so that's 1 and 4. Okay, so 1 is the maximum value that player 2 can secure for himself. Okay. So that's the next theorem is if gamma one star, gamma n star is Nash equilibrium of T stage game, then J I of gamma 1 star gamma n star is always greater than equal to C bar I which I am going to define as min of A minus I max of I A I C I A I A minus I So this is the maximum cost that the player I has to incur uh, under any given circumstance. 
okay and uh, this has to be oh this has to be less than equal to so this is the maximum cost that he has to pay so the equilibrium payoff average equilibrium payoff or average equilibrium cost is going to be less than equal to c bar i okay and then there is the next result so these two are fairly theorem 1 and theorem 2 this is theorem 2 fairly obvious uh, not so difficult to prove <coughs> theorem 3 which is somewhat complicated this is this is min max oh yes that's true this is max this is min max min yeah this is man, max min correct so for every gamma minus i there exists gamma i star which is a function of gamma minus i such that <coughs> j i gamma i star okay this is a slightly uh, non-trivial result what it says is given the strategy of other players player i can always come up with its own strategy behavioral strategy such that the cost it's going to incur is always going to be less than or equal to c bar of i c bar of i is defined here so that's its maximum cost okay so these are the three results for the dynamic setting well in this part you have to explicitly construct a behavioral strategy that's going to achieve the cost okay what's the simplest behavioral strategy that can achieve the cost just act according to whatever is the minimizing ai here okay that's the simplest one but you can construct more sophisticated strategies that can reduce the cost okay now we want to understand this question what vector of expected payoffs or cost is achievable under any equilibrium <coughs> okay so we want to characterize that set of payoffs that's possible so in order to introduce that so these are the elementary results let's now start answering the question okay which will build upon these elementary results so the question, uh, so the first thing I want to introduce is V, which is defined as uh, X in Rn such that Xi is greater than or equal to phi bar I for all I in one n so these are the set of payoffs that are better than the minimax value that player i can secure for himself okay but <coughs> this should hold for all players so it looks like a box in a high dimensional space and then f is convex set of u i a or let me write it as u 1 of a u n of a for a in a 1 a n okay so I look at the vector of these payoffs and I get uh, 
for all possible values of the actions that one can take and look at the convex combination. So let's go back to this game and look at the convex combinations. This is my R2 because uh, that's, that's the payoff of player 1 and that's the payoff of player 2. So what is 1-1 one, one here? That looks somewhere here. 4-0 would be here. So this is, sorry, this is 4-0. This is 1-1. One, one. This is 0-4. And then I have 3-3. Three, three. 3, 3. So what's the convex combination? That's this region, right? Everything inside this is V. This is my set V. Okay. What? Sorry? Oh, that's F, right. What is my set V? So, so 1, my V1 bar is equal to 1, so I have to look at all the values of payoff that's greater than 1. So that's, that's this region. And then I have to look at all the values of V bar 2 that's greater than 1, so that's this region. So this is my, this is my uh, F. No, this is my F. This is my F and this is my V, set V, okay? And so, so well, the set V is everything, everything away from, uh, everything right to this, uh, this particular line and everything above this particular line. And this intersection is F inverse, F intersection V. Okay, and so it turns out that for T stage repeated game, you can get arbitrarily close to any point within this set. Okay, and for infinite stage repeated game, you can achieve any point within the set. Okay, so there are two results that's called folk theorem. Folk. The reason why it's called folk theorem is that until it was proved, everyone believed it, but nobody had a proof. Okay, so that's why it's called folk theorem. Uh, so the folk theorem says that folk theorem one that let let beta uh, be a Nash equilibrium of static game such that C i beta is strictly greater than, oh, uh, I'm working with utility. So u i of beta is strictly greater than v i bar. Okay, so assume that there is a Nash equilibrium of the static game which achieves a payoff that's strictly better than V i bar. And, and pick an x in f, inver f intersection b. So I'm going to pick an x in f intersection V. Okay, don't confuse this with the state. Okay, this is a vector of payoff. This is not a state in this particular game. Then for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a T epsilon 
in n such that for all t greater than equal to t epsilon there exists an equilibrium gamma 1 star gamma n star such that max of i j i of gamma 1 star gamma n star minus x i is less than epsilon. Okay, so all we need to assume is that there exists a Nash equilibrium that gives you a payoff in this particular region. So let's say there is a Nash equilibrium here. Okay, this is the Nash equilibrium payoff. All that is needed in order to prove that Fock theorem, which says that if you have a payoff, if you have a Nash equilibrium for the static game, where the vector of payoffs, expected payoff that each player gets, lies in this particular region. And I'm going to pick any x in f inverse v. So let's say I f intersection b, v, which let's say I pick this value of x as my payoff, uh, the set of expected payoffs. Okay, then for every epsilon greater than zero, I can find a horizon length so that if I play the game optimally, or rather in in uh, if I play this game according to the Nash equilibrium, then I can get arbitrarily close to xi. So I can achieve this payoff, or rather an epsilon neighborhood of this payoff vector. Every player can achieve it. Okay, So we can find an equilibrium for this dynamic game so that we can find a payoff within this ball, and we can achieve it. Okay. So what's the, so what's the use of this? What it says is, if all the players were cooperating, they could achieve a payoff of this, right? That's the best payoff that both the players can have. But it turns out that that's not the only solution. There are multiple other solutions that are epsilon Nash equilibrium, and they will lie exactly, the set of payoffs will lie exactly in this region. So in some sense, it has characterized the entire vector of expected payoffs that is achievable in this particular game. Okay? And it's not like there are pockets that are achievable and other pockets that are not achievable. Any point in this set is achievable as long as you're willing to have some sort of uh, lax. Okay? That's epsilon. You can be in the epsilon neighborhood of any payoff within this particular set, which was not the case in the original static game. Okay, in the original game, there were only certain payoffs that you can achieve, okay, which will be na the Nash equilibrium payoff. So if you look at the static game, these are the vector of payoffs that are achievable, but this is one Nash equilibrium, this is another Nash equilibrium, this is third Nash equilibrium. Those are the only three equilibrium payoffs that are achievable. But as soon as you make it a dynamic, a repeated game, where players can observe the history, they can cooperate, they can punish each other, it has expanded the set of payoffs that are achievable and that region, achievable region is, is exactly this, this region. Okay? And this is the best region where both players are cooperating all the time, but you could have equilibrium in which some players are defecting once in a while or not playing according to, well it's still an equilibrium, okay? There's, it's still an equilibrium, but Individually, you will see that at that stage, they are not, uh, they are probably playing T or L, which is the Nash equilibrium, rather than the cooperating equilibrium. Okay? So, and in fact, the, the way they prove the Fock theorem 
is by by breaking down this long horizon T epsilon, the long horizon of game into smaller games in which they are cycling through a certain, well, let me go through the proof idea because it's, it's important to see how they construct an epsilon Nash for this particular game. So this proof idea is divide t into n cycles of horizon k and a tail of horizon l. Okay. In each cycle, play according to an equilibrium that gives expected payoff. of x or close to x, expected payoff close to x and in, uh, in tail play according to Nash equilibrium beta. Okay, And then uh, there are two things that you have to prove. First is every player can guarantee himself a payoff close to x high, right? That's one thing. So it should be in equilibrium. So that's one thing that you have to prove. And the second thing you have to prove is that the sum of all the average payoff is as close to x high as possible. Okay. And if you, and if you look at the proof, which is quite long, but this is the essential idea. If you look at the proof, there are two things that are essential in the proof. The first is, well, if you, you've come up with this idea that in each cycle they are going to play according to some Nash equilibrium that's close to x, and then in tail, they are going to act according to this Nash equilibrium beta that we started with, or a bunch of betas. If there are multiple such Nash equilibrium that satisfy this condition, you just cycle through them. So this is the idea, and you came up with, an, with a strategy, and then you uh, prove that well, it's in, uh, well, it's uh, it achieves this this payoff. Then what you have to prove is that that strategy that you have devised, if one person deviates from that strategy unilaterally, then the other players can punish him, right? So that's what you have to prove that if one player moves away from the strategy, if one player moves away from the strategy, then the players will punish him, so his expected payoff will reach this level. Okay, and as soon as it reaches this level, then it, it's not in his best interest to deviate from that strategy. So that's the basic idea behind the proof. Of course, you have to, I mean, you, you can do the math or you can read the proof online, but that's the basic idea. You cycle through uh, some equilibrium in each of these uh, horizon K, and then you have a tail of horizon L in which you play according to some Nash equilibrium of the original static game. Yeah. What's the point of the cycle? Uh, the point of the cycle, so remember, this is the average payoff, right? This is the average expected payoff. So in each cycle of horizon k, you will be able to find an equilibrium that's close to x. OK, so if you look at the average payoff in each cycle, it's equal to x. So the average payoff over all the cycles will be equal to something that is close to x. OK. Uh, so in some sense, each at the end of each cycle, you are restarting the entire game with a clean slate. Okay, you are forgetting everything that has happened in the past until someone deviates. If someone deviates, then everyone else is going to start punishing him. That's their equilibrium strategy. Okay. 
Now it turns out that well, for a for a finite game, this is true. If you have an infinite game, that is the horizon length is goes all the way to infinity, then every payoff within this region is achievable. That is, this epsilon would go to zero, and this t epsilon would go to infinity. Okay. So every payoff in this region is achievable in the infinite game. Whereas, if you look at the static game, only certain amount, certain number of payoffs were achievable in equilibrium. So overall, the set of payoffs that were achievable when you went from static to dynamic. So in static game, there were only certain set of payoffs that were achievable. In dynamic game, you have enlarged the set of payoffs that were achievable. So, so what's the crux? If you have a game set up between two players, but you want to enlarge the set of payoffs that, are, uh, that each of those players can have, allow them to play a dynamic game and allow them to keep track of the histories of each other's action. Okay? So as soon as you allow them to keep the history of their action, they will start cooperating. And in the end, the amount of payoff that they can get, expected payoffs they can get, will be much larger than what they can get individually if they were playing a static game. So, so for infinite horizon, Every x and in f intersection v is achievable. Achievable at equilibrium. I don't think, uh, I don't know, but I don't think anyone has proved uh, what should be the strategy in these infinite games. Okay, how do you compute the achievable? So if I pick a payoff in x intersection, in, in f intersection v, uh, what should the equilibrium be uh, for them to be able to achieve this x? Okay, so that's a problem that you can potentially look at uh, during your uh, research. Any question on this? Okay. No, it's not. Uh, in repeated games, the cooperation comes because players are non-cooperative. Okay, <laughs> so the idea is <coughs> that's a very good question. Okay, uh, so let's say we are two separate players. We have our own cost function, and we are playing a non-cooperative game. It so <coughs> turns out that if I cooperate with you, I'll get a better payoff. So I will cooperate with you. Okay, so if you look at this game, uh, how do we agree? So if we are playing a static game, this is the payoff that we will get because that's the Nash equilibrium. But now if I'm playing a dynamic game, what I can say is, well, I'm always going to play R until you have played a T, in which case I'll always play T. Okay, and you can say the same thing, right? In which case we will always be playing R because if I, I know that in case I switch to T because I might get a better payoff, right? You will start playing L, in which case I will be worse off. So it's not in my best interest to not cooperate with you, okay? And in fact, the, uh, the prevalent uh, idea in economics is the reason why we are all cooperating in today's world is because we have played this game over a long period of time since whatever, 10,000 BC. And we have realized that cooperation is the best strategy. Okay, it doesn't help each of us to not cooperate with each other. That's the idea. You had a question, Balsam. Yeah, the question was uh, about the last statement that we know that the payoffs are achievable, but we don't know how to. Which, yeah, what strategy to play? in this infinite game. You see the first problem is, the, the, the real problem is, how do you keep track of all the actions of the other players? 
right? The history is increasing every point of time. The more number of actions you have to recall of the other players, the more your memory requirement is, right? And the more you have to do processing about that, keep track of what action should I take at this tree, at this leaf of the tree, what action I should take at this leaf of the tree. So of course, there are, there are practical issues with implementing such an algorithm because uh, such a, for playing such a strategy, because now you have to keep track of all the actions of all the players in the past. So somehow you need to come up with sufficient statistics that can allow you to come up with an equilibrium that's arbitrarily close to x, but the memory requirement is much less. So if you remember in fictitious play, for instance, the memory requirement was very little. All you had to keep track of is the empirical probability distribution of the other player. You didn't do the assignment, so you don't remember. <laughs> but so in fictitious play, um, you keep track of the empirical probability of the other person's playing, other person's actions. Okay? And it turns out that it converges to saddle point equilibrium. But in these games, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to compress information. You have to keep track of all the information. So the question is, how do you compress information based on the probability matrix, or sorry, based on the matrix game that you're playing, the matrix game that you started with, okay? Uh, I don't know what the answer to that question is. So somehow you have to keep track of uh, the actions. So that's another, another good question for research. Uh, but yeah, any other question? I had an idea of like, I mean, a possible solution to this, mm -hmm. but I don't know if it works. So, so if you pick a point in this uh, like F intersection V, then it's in the co convex all of the uh, action. I mean, yes. The pair of right. topples. Uh, so we can maybe time share the action. Yes, yes. And then if one of the players deviates, then we could like, for right, but how would you prove that the timeshare that you came up with is an equilibrium or not? Yeah, so like, I mean, if, uh, for an infinite horizon game, right. uh, time sharing would be like, I mean, any point in the... So his idea is, well, this point can be written as convex combination of this, 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 and this point. So each player can act in such a fashion with certain empirical probability distribution so that uh, the this uh, so that this point is the expected payoff but the question real question is whether that's an equilibrium or not for the infinite game okay you can do time sharing but that seems like you're not keeping track of the actions of the other player well, only for punishment you are keeping track of the actions. Otherwise, you are not keeping track of the actions. Yeah, that, I mean, uh, that reduces the memory. Using, so, I mean, yeah, that does reduce the memory. But does that also? Does that is is that also in equilibrium? I I don't think it's it will be in equilibrium, because you have reduced the memory to bare minimum. Uh, you are not keeping track of. Yeah, I, I think you have reduced the memory to so, so I mean, such a bare minimum memory that uh, I don't think it, it will work out if you, if you try to find an equilibrium. But it's a good thing to think about. Okay. And there is a similar theorem for discounted case where the payoffs are discounted. So instead of taking the average payoff, you are discounting the future payoffs or future cost. So you get a similar, you get a similar result there as well. So now I want to, uh, so any other question about this? No? So now I want to talk about, uh, uh, about vector payoff cases. So that's repeated game with vector payoffs.
and there are only two players in this okay player one is uh, let's say player one is the maximizer and player two is the minimizer but in this case uh, let's say i is 1 to m and j equals to 1 to n and the idea is the player ones payoff is u that maps i cross j to r m okay and so far we have talked about utility function that maps a set of preferences to r or set of actions to r but now i am considering the case where it's r m okay so the way you think about r m is so if if this is you, this is the company that you are negotiating a job with, RM would be how much salary you have, how many vacations you have, how many sick leaves you have, and so on. Okay? And in some sense, you are not able to come up with a value. How so if, if you get 20 days of sick leave, how much value that is to you in terms of actual wages? Okay? So you're not able to come up with that specific idea, so that's why you're just keeping it in terms of RM, okay? So it's a vector payoff case. And this is player one's payoff, so player two's cost is given by this expression. So in this case, We have to understand the notion of approachability. So let's see what that is. <coughs> so definition of approachability Okay, so the model is again similar. Uh, it's a repeated game, but with vector payoff. So that's the only difference. Because and yeah, is this a zero sum game? It's a zero sum game, yeah. But Vectors. yeah, zero sum in every every dimension. So a set C is. approachable by player 1 if or player i let's say player i if there exist gamma i such that probability of gamma i gamma minus i of limit t goes to infinity j i t <coughs> for every gamma minus i So what is my j i of t? So my j i of t will be equal to, which is a function of actually gamma i and gamma minus i, is equal to 1 over capital 1 over t summation s equals 1 to t c of no, u of a i 
a minus i. So this is the average average payoff to player one and the distance between the average payoff and the set is goes to zero as t goes to infinity almost surely okay so this convergence is in the almost sure sense for all values of gamma minus i for all values of gamma minus i so everybody knows what the distance between a point and a set is distance between a point and a set so this is or this is my set C this is a point X what's the distance between the set uh, the set C and point X it's the minimum distance between X and any other point in the C okay so D of X comma C is min of all Y in C X minus Y okay and C is not convex okay C is not convex here so I'm not making any assumption about convexity it's the same as so if C were convex it's the same as projection of X onto C okay but C is not convex here it can be any non-convex set so the the point he point here is this is my RM and I define a set C here non-empty set C here and I'm saying that well this set C is approachable by player I if it has a strategy so that no matter how the other player acts you will always be able to get an average payoff which is inside the set or at the boundary of the set okay so that's the definition of approachability by the way uh, the other definition is a set is uh, what is the other definition excludable so there is another definition of excludability excludable so set C is excludable if there exists a strategy I such that you are always in the Delta neighborhood of the set so you're always outside of the set C okay at least with a distance of Delta so I let me write it as rigorously C in RM excludable by player I if there exist gamma I such that for all gamma minus I the probability that D of or limit T goes to infinity D of J I T comma C is greater than equal to Delta is equal to 1 okay so what this says excludability I have defined this set C in the space of all possible payoffs and player I so we say that C is excludable by player I if there exists a strategy so that player I can guarantee that it's always going to be so this is my set C this is my C plus Delta or BC Delta so that is that is the delta so the boundary of this bo this uh, set B of C comma Delta is always Delta away from C and player I can guarantee that it's always going to be here it's always going to get a payoff outside this boundary okay which is distance Delta away from C so that's the definition of excludability now one thing that's obvious is if player one if there is a set which is achievable or which is approachable by player one then it cannot be excludable by the other player right so if player one can guarantee certain payoff by picking a strategy 
then player two cannot have another strategy which can not allow him to get that cost. So uh, obvious fact, I want to write it. fact a set C cannot be both approachable by player I and excludable by player J. Excludable by player minus I. Okay, and we ask ourselves again the same question that in this particular game, what kind of payoffs are achievable by player I? Okay, so if I play this game again and again, what class of payoffs can I achieve by picking a specific strategy? So let's try to uh, figure that out. Any, any question with the definition of approachability and excludability? Okay, it's fairly straightforward. So, so let me define R1 of P, which is the vectors summation U u of i comma j p i q j q in delta n this is sum over i comma j so if i fix the strategy of player one to be p which is a distribution over its action set then this is the set of achievable payoff given any strategy of player two How would they compare? So, so well, nobody knows how they will be geometric picture, but here is how I think it should look like. So this is my Rm, and let's say this is the set of all payoffs possible, right? With any strategy of the two players and then this will be this will be the uh, set of payoffs that are achievable by player 1 and this would be the set of payoffs that are achievable by player 2 okay so there will be some overlap between the set of payoffs that are achieved well this would be the set of cost and this would be the set of payoffs, right? Because one person's payoff is the other person's cost. So this will be the set of achievable cost by player two. This will be the set of achievable payoffs by player uh, by player one or yeah. And yeah. So if player one picks a point outside the intersection and player two picks a point on this side outside the intersection. Right. So and they both have strategies that can Right. Well, it has to guarantee that no matter what the other player pays, it can guarantee it can get that payoff. Yeah, but like the approachable set is by definition those points where, where I can take the game. Correct. Yeah. Where you can take the game, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, what if they select uh, two points at each of their sets uh -huh. outside their intersection? I see. So you're saying if I if this person selects this point and this person selects this point. Good point. <coughs> Maybe this is not how it looks. Okay, so, 
So they have to overlap the achievability, but the achievability cannot overlap with each other. I don't, uh, so they haven't said, they haven't said that the two, the sets of achievable payoffs have to intersect with each other exactly. There is no such result, at least not in the book. Uh, but your point is valid. If I pick, if I'm player one and I pick this point, and you are player two, you pick this point, then which one is achievable? Right? So they should be they should be the same. You have a point? Just no? not a specific point to just the set. Mm -hmm. So like because you're just looking at the distance of whatever point you're going to mm -hmm. uh, from that point to the set. So like you're not really picking a point, a specific point in the set, you just know you're gonna be close to some point in the set. Is that right? Well, yes. So in the limit, you will be arbitrarily close to the set. Uh, but yes, you will be close to the set. So you will be probably here, but not here until you take the entire time going to infinity. Right, but you don't know what point you're going towards, though. Just Sorry? You don't know, like, you're not specifically going for, towards a certain point. Right. Just some point. In the set. So yeah. in this case, you can't, like, choose a point not in the intersection. If those are the first bullets. Yeah, I mean, I think it needs uh, a little bit of thought. It's not that. Yeah, it shouldn't look like this. There's, there has to be something going on here, which, you know, we don't understand. It's not there in the book. So I haven't seen uh, what it would look like in this particular space. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at it, yes, there is a range. This is the maximum payoff that one. I mean, the, 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 uh, the approachable range. Yeah. It's not as, as I mean, if okay. it's approachable, then for x, there is a certain interval which is approachable and for y. Oh, I see. So you are saying that there might be a limit like this yes. and like this, and everything here is approachable yes. by both the players. That might be, yeah, maybe, that might work out. Maybe not one line, but two vertical and two I see, lines. okay. So Something like this. Yes, everything in that position will be. Could be, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so his point is, there could be horizontal lines and vertical lines and everything within this set is achievable and outside this set may or may not be achievable. Uh, could be, yeah. Okay, but let's uh, go back to our earlier discussion where we wanted to find out what are the set of payoffs that are achievable by certain player in this class of games. So we need to define R1P and R2 of Q. So R1 of P is the set of achievable payoffs if player one fixes its strategy to be P and player two can play any strategy Q. And this is the set of achievable payoffs which is in which player two fixes his strategy as Q and player one can pick any strategy P. And then I'm going to define a set C as a B set. So And the definition is as follows. Close set C in Rm is a V set if 
for every x in f minus c remember f is the convex hull of u of a1 a2 okay so the convex hull of the entire set of vectors so if for every x in f minus c is the b set for player i yeah b set for player i <coughs> If for every x in f minus c there exists a y in c and y equals to argument x minus y, y should be in or uh, x minus z, z is in c. Okay, So this could have multiple values. The projection of x onto the set c can have multiple values, so y has to be one of those values. And pi in delta ai are Okay, so I haven't defined, well the action sets would be AI and PI is the strategy of player I. So there exists a mixed strategy of player I such that R1P is in the set of X is it x minus y? No, y minus y minus x transpose z greater than equal to. So this is z such that y transpose x minus z is greater than equal to y minus x transpose y. and x is in z such that y minus x transpose z is less than equal to y minus x transpose y. So let's look at a picture Uh, where do I draw the picture? Okay, this is my F. This is my set C. And this is my R1 of P and this is my X. So I pick a point X in F minus C. So this is my C, so I pick a point X that is outside C, but within this F. And there are two points that are that are close to uh, that are close to uh, the set C. Uh, so, so that is close to point X and they lie in set C. Okay, So that's one point is here and the other point is here. So there exists a y in C which is in the argument of x minus z. So they, these are these two y's. So that if I draw a hyperplane like this which is passing through this point y and it's perpendicular orthogonal to x minus y if I draw a hyperplane, R1 of P lies on one side of the hyperplane and X lies on the other side of the hyperplane. Okay, So this would be a supporting hyperplane or a separating hyperplane theorem 
if it, C was a convex set, but here we don't make that assumption. C is not a, not a convex set. And all we need is one such hyperplane, okay? Because if you look at it, this, if you draw a hyperplane here, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't, uh, that goes through the set R1 of P. R1 of P doesn't lie on one side of the hyperplane, okay? So we just need one hyperplane that passes through this point Y and is perpendicular to X minus Y and R1 of P is on one side of this hyperplane and X is on the other side of the hyperplane. So then this set C is known as a B set for player I. <coughs> and one of the main result in this particular field is Blackwell's approachability theorem. Blackwell's approachability theorem, which was proved in 1956, which said that if a set, if C is a B set for player I, then it is approachable by player I. Then C is approachable by player I. How do we characterize such a set? I don't know. Uh, there are some specific classes of games for which this set can be characterized and it's given in the book. Uh, but in general, I don't know whether someone has worked on an algorithm that characterizes at least an upper envelope of such sets or a lower envelope of such sets. So we know which sets are approachable by players assuming they play for infinite time steps. They play the same game for infinite time steps. But that's the, that's the idea behind approach, Blackwell's approachability theorem that as long as you can prove or you can come up with a close set C and you can prove that it's a B set for the player, then you know that that player can achieve that particular payoff vector as long as that payoff vector is within the set C. Okay? C doesn't have to be a convex set. It can be any non-convex set. Okay? All it needs is to make sure that your R1 of P lies on one side of the hyperplane and X lies on the other side of the hyperplane. That's all is needed. Okay, any, any question about that? Okay, so again the idea is with a static game, you might have a small set of payoffs that, are, that is achievable, but as soon as you allow players to have history, keep track of the actions of the other player, suddenly the payoff, the set of payoffs that you can achieve expands and if you allow the time to go to infinity, which means you're playing this game again and again, all the way to, uh, for infinite number of times, then there is a way to characterize the class of sets that are achievable, the class of payoffs that are achievable, okay? So in terms, in, in the case where the payoff was a real number, uh, we had studied the repeated games right for n players and we had this f intersection v that is achievable whereas if you have vector payoffs for two players then we have a characterization through Blackwell's approachability theorem which says that if a set is a b set then it is approachable by player i so there exists a strategy so that player i can force the payoff to be one of the point within that set okay so the algorithmic, I mean, there are algorithmic aspects of this particular game, but you really have to have a compelling uh, application so that you can motivate the discussion and use some of the theory that we have studied uh, to, to prove certain things. But, but right now, I am not aware of any, I mean, in e economics, there are a lot of ideas that, are, that people have studied, but as far as engineering is concerned, I haven't uh, seen 
uh, many applications that use uh, these ideas from repeated games. There is of course another form of repeated game where, you, where one player has certain kind of information or both players may have certain kind of information and as they act, the belief over what information the other player has updates in a sequential fashion and depending upon what kind of game they are playing, you will either see one player revealing the information to the other player, you will see cases where one player doesn't reveal any information to the other player and you will see cases where there is some sort of hybrid, so there is some sort of pooling equilibrium. Okay? Uh, I mean, it's not called a pooling equilibrium, but it's some sort of hybrid equilibrium where only a little bit of information gets transmitted, but not a whole lot. Okay? So, uh, what I don't know is uh, whether I should cover those games or not. Those, those are all, uh, you study those games with the background of these games, so at least now you have a background to study or read about those games uh, in the books. But, uh, but I want to know what uh, prefer, I mean, do you, do you want to study that game? If yes, then I'll cover it in the next class or I'll move on to algorithmic game theory, which is algorithms for finding Nash equilibrium. So what's the preference? Do you want to know what the equilibrium of those games are in which players have private information? How many of you want to know? Three people, four people, five, okay. How many of you want to uh, get to the algorithmic game theory aspect of the course where you start studying algorithms for uh, solving Nash equilibrium? Okay, <laughs> okay, only two people. Okay, so, <laughs> so, so I'll cover the other repeated game where players have private information in the next class on, uh, on Tuesday. And then I'll do a review lecture on Thursday because the next to next Tuesday is the midterm for this class. Okay, so I'll do a review lecture and you can ask me any questions on Thursday. Okay? All right.